Good morning, everyone. About 13 years ago, in May of 2005, there was a very exciting day for those of us who uh, advocate for the rights of people with disabilities, and indeed for all people with disabilities uh, in Ontario. Because it was on May 10th, 2005, at the Ontario Legislature, that the members of the Ontario Legislature unanimously passed into law the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. This was a law that we folks with disabilities have been campaigning for for a decade. And when we started that campaign, uh, the likelihood of our succeeding seemed pretty far off, very remote, if not utterly impossible. Well, 10 years after we started, there we were at Queen's Park with all three parties unanimously voting for this legislation and then unanimously rising to applaud its passage. This doesn't happen very often at, at any legislature in this country, and it certainly doesn't very hap happen very often in the lives of those of us who do advocacy uh, for people with disabilities. This law had three main components. The first is it requires Ontario to become fully accessible to people with disabilities within 20 years of its passage. It was passed in 2005, so it, its deadline was 2025. The second thing it did was it put someone in charge of getting us there. It's not good enough to just say we're going to get there. Make it work. Someone's got to be in charge. And the someone is the government of Ontario. And the third thing it did is it spelled out what the government must do to get us there. It did not require the government to go out and fix every accessibility barrier that people with disabilities face. Uh, that would be unrealistic. Uh, and would make no sense, but rather it required the government uh, to do two things. It required it to develop a series of detailed regulations called accessibility standards. And they were these standards would spell out in detail what the public and private sector needs to do to remove existing barriers and prevent new ones, and by when they must do it. The law also required the Ontario government to enforce this legislation. Why did we ask for this law? Well, we asked for it because people with disabilities for too long have faced too many barriers when they try to get a job or use public services or buy goods uh, or, uh, rent a place, or rent or buy a place to live or just enjoy the other things that other folks without disabilities take uh, for granted. The barriers they face have always been illegal under the Charter of Rights, or at least in the past 36 years, they've been illegal under the Charter of Rights and the Human Rights Code. But there were two problems that led to the enactment of this law. Laws like the Human Rights Code and the Charter of Rights are just too vague. They just say, don't discriminate. They don't tell a restaurant owner what they've got to do. They just say, uh, to become fully accessible. They don't tell you how to design a building or a website or to operate customer services. They don't give you any specifics. So obligated organizations don't know what they have to do. And as well, the Human Rights Code and the Charter of Rights require individuals with disabilities to be private accessibility cops, bringing their own claims one barrier at a time. This was not an effective way of solving a problem. The AODA was meant to make the rights guaranteed in the Charter of Rights and the Human Rights Code become a reality in the lives of people with disabilities without individuals with disabilities having to sue one barrier at a time, without obligated organizations having to reinvent the accessibility wheel one organization at a time. Well, that was an exciting day uh, 13 years ago. How's it working? That's our topic today. Well, four years ago on February 3rd, uh, 2014, at this same law school, I gave a lecture answering that question uh, for the first um, nine years of the charter, from 2000, or, uh, pardon me, nine years of the AODA, from, from 2005 to 2014. This lecture is meant to be an update, and when we post it online, we'll link to that earlier lecture so that people can, can watch them both. This is, that's the prequel, this is the sequel. But let me begin by giving you a quick summary of what that earlier lecture had to say. And then I can launch right into updating you about what's 
happened in the past four years. Well, in a nutshell, over the first four or five years uh, after the AODA was passed, to its credit, the government of Ontario uh, uh, did a decent job of getting right to work. The first thing it had to do was to develop accessibility standards. It named the first five it would work on. They were a good choice and it decided on them quite quickly. The first five would address accessibility uh, barriers in the areas of transportation, customer service, employment, the built environment, uh, and information communications. And implementing the AODA, following its directions, the government appointed five standards development committees made up of folks from the disability sector, and from the obligated sector, those who would have to comply, excuse me, to develop recommendations of what should be included in these. And they got right to work, starting in 2006 in some cases, and a little later in others. And by, excuse me, 2010, they had all reported out their recommendations, and the government had actually enacted the first of those standards in 2007, customer service. In 2011, it enacted three more, all in one batch, dealing with transportation, employment, and information communications. And then in 2012, it enacted uh, a, a final package, not dealing with the entire built environment, but a very limited range of built environment barriers, those in what they, the government called public spaces. Basically outside buildings, uh, accessible parking, uh, recreation trails, uh, sidewalks, one or two things inside buildings, customers addressing the accessibility and customer service areas. So they got to work early and they got quite busy. Uh, and they did it with little experience and knowledge about how to do this. By the way, in 2013, not under the AODA, the government passed uh, some amendments to uh, um, upgrade the accessibility requirements in the building, Ontario Building Code as it relates to inside buildings. And my conclusion when I spoke uh, four years about this is, uh, ago about this is that these standards were helpful, but they certainly weren't sufficient. They weren't sufficient for two reasons. One, they don't cover all the barriers we face, and when they do so, they were too weak. So they had helpful components, just not enough and not strong enough. And two, they largely, if not almost entirely, dealt with preventing new barriers and virtually said little, said little or nothing about removing old barriers. So um, they were helpful, but they weren't going to solve the accessibility problem. The other thing I, I, I had to say uh, four years ago was that when implementing this legislation, part of the government's job is uh, to develop these standards. Uh, but the other major part of the government's job is to enforce the standards they enact. And I summarized how um, as of 20, late 2013, just before I gave that lecture, we, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, the grassroots coalition that I, I chair, we had revealed in the fall of 2013 through freedom of information uh, uh, revelations that we'd secured, that the government was doing a very, very weak and poor job of enforcing the legislation, despite having promised that they would effectively enforce it. More about that in a few minutes. Finally, I pointed out in that lecture that the government was not making effective use of the other levers of power that it has to promote accessibility. So, well then, let's, let's, that's the end of the prequel. How are we doing now? How have we done in the past four years? In summary, we've made some progress, but it's not enough, and it's been even slower in the past four years than it was just before that. We are not doing a good enough job either developing the accessibility standards we need to ensure that we reach full accessibility by 2025, nor in enforcing them 
nor at using the other levers of power that the government has at its disposal and in most cases are easy to use uh, in order to ensure that we reach the goal of full accessibility by 2025. We were not on schedule four years ago. We are certainly not on schedule now and time is running out. So let me break, let me illustrate uh, why and how this all is. I want to begin uh, by um, taking this from my assessment and that of my coalition to the assessment of the situation as of late 2014 by an independent person not connected with the disability rights movement or the government who was appointed by the government to conduct a mandatory independent review of the legislation and how it's working. Under the AODA, the government is obliged, first after four years and then every three years after that, to appoint an independent person to take our collective temperature, to let us know how, to see how we're doing. Are we on schedule? Are we doing enough? And to make recommendations for reforms. That's a really important provision. Uh, the first independent review was conducted in 2009 to 2010. It's conducted by uh, a gentleman named Charles Beer, a former cabinet minister and a, um, a really excellent choice. The second independent review was appointed in late summer 2013 and rendered its report at the end of 2014, made public in February of 2015. And that review was conducted by Mayo Moran, also an excellent choice, then the Dean of Law at the uh, Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. Well, what did those independent reviews conclude? The first one in 2010, the Beer Report, was conducted when only one accessibility standard had been made and none were yet enforceable. He concluded at that point in time that far too few people really knew out there about the AODA and knew what they were supposed to do. He found real problems with the way the government was uh, conducting the standards development process. He thought things were well-intentioned. There was a lot of support for the legislation but it needed substantial improvement. And he made detailed recommendations. He said that essentially there was a, a need to revitalize the implementation of the AODA and breathe new life into its implementation for the government to show new leadership on it. After all the excitement when it passed, he concluded, back in 2005, government leadership moved on to other things and essentially went back to business as usual. He said that more than mere uh, tinkering was needed, he was calling for substantial action. The problem is, after his report, most of what he recommended didn't happen. 2014 comes along and Mayo Moran conducts her independent review. In June of that year, we submitted a detailed 350-page brief illustrating in, in incredible detail the scope of the difficulty, saying, look, there's been some progress. We're saying, not saying that there hasn't been some progress, but nowhere near what we need and nowhere near what we could achieve. And many of our, uh, uh, um, our points made their way into the final report of the Moran uh, Independent Review. In a nutshell, she concluded, like Charles Beer, that there was a need for the government to show strong new leadership on this issue. And she pointed specifically to the Premier, saying the Premier needs to, to show leadership on this issue uh, and spearhead action on this issue. She again, she basically echoed the need for revitalization of the implementation of the act that Charles Beer had made and that she didn't see having, having materialized in the intervening time. She concluded echoing our assessment that the accessibility standards that have been passed to date were too vague, too unclear, insufficient, and from the point of view of obligated organizations at times, hard to even understand. 
She said, and this is really quite powerful, she said that she'd heard from people with disabilities that after nine years on the books, the AODA had not made a significant difference in the lives of people with disabilities. Now they're coming up here on the 10th, at that point on the 10th anniversary of this law, halfway to the goal of, of full accessibility by 2025, halfway to the time period for reaching that goal, and yet we weren't on schedule. And people were not, not only weren't we on schedule, she didn't use the words we are not on schedule, but the overall thrust of what she's saying is a lot needs to change to be on schedule. But even worse than not being on schedule, um, her report echoed the feedback that it, law after nine years had not even made a significant difference in the lives of people with disabilities. This for a, a lot of people is a huge letdown. She, um, relying on the data that we had made public about the inadequate enforcement of the AODA, she called for its enforcement to be, um, to be beefed up. We had revealed just months before in November of 2013, that after months uh, of being enforceable against the private sector, the government knew that a substantial majority of private sector organizations with at least 20 employees were in breach of the law. They had a duty to have filed an accessibility self-report and a clear majority, I think it was upwards of 65, 70%, had not done so well over 50%. Moreover, as of that point in time, November of 2013, the government not, had not level, levied a single monetary penalty or issued a single compliance order. None against these private sector organizations. Moreover, this was not due to a lack of government funds for enforcement. We documented that the office that has the mandate for enforcement, the Accessibility Directorate, had underspent its budget every year since uh, it got mandate under uh, AODA, and that this totaled over about an eight-year period, seven or eight-year period, about 24 million unspent dollars. Now, that's not to say they've still got it in the bank, but it illustrates every year they're under budget. So they know of violations, they've got authority to enforce, they got money to use for enforcement, and they were doing a paltry job. She echoed this and called for, for improvements uh, in enforcement. She also identified other areas uh, where reform was needed. For example, in the way the Ontario government itself implements accessibility within its, its own organization. She again echoed that there is support out there in the community for this legislation, both within the disability community and among obligated organizations, but frustration with how it's being implemented. <coughs> obligated organizations said they weren't getting the kind of guidance they need from the government on what to do. And one of the most stunning things in her report relates to something that's quite, kind of a pervasive stereotype. Out there, there's a, a stereotype that people with disabilities want to regulate everybody no matter what the cost, and that obligated organizations want no regulations no matter how helpful. Uh, and what she found was that there was a common request, a, a, pardon me, a commonality in the positions of the disability community and the business community. Both said they want detail, more detailed accessibility standards. Tell us what to do, please. And that the government had too often fallen down on the job. Finally, she identified one area where she said there, things were particularly lacking and that was action on the built environment. Well, built environment barriers are just one category of barriers that people with disabilities face. They were still among the important one, uh, one area of important ones where too little was being done and there was really no action that, that had been seen in the area of, for example, uh, retrofits uh, of the existing built environment. So that's what she had to say. Now let me turn to the question of, which I think is a powerful one. Why is this so? Why is this so? What's the problem? 
Before I take you from her report to the present, it, it, it's helpful to take a moment and turn to this. Now, I can only, from the outside, offer you um, some thought, um, but I hope it's informed. I, I want to offer two reasons. First is one which I've said publicly, and the government's own uh, special advisor on accessibility uh, for several years, David Onley, himself a former lieutenant governor, has also said, and that is, a good number of the members of the legislature who were in the legislature in 2005 when the AODA was passed have left public life. Those who were with us in the 90s when we were campaigning for this legislation and fighting to get it passed, and those who were there from 2003 to 2005 when we, uh, after Dalton McGinty uh, became Premier of Ontario on a promise uh, to pass this legislation, uh, many, a majority of them, I believe now, have left politics and have been replaced by other folks who are, I'm not, I'm not saying they're against this, but for them, the AODA is just one of 750 laws that are on the books when they took office. Not a prize that we fought for for a decade and an important signature law, important to all parties, and that led to a unanimous passage and a standing ovation. There just wasn't the enthusiasm that we saw in government that there was before. But there's a second reason, and it's a practical one. Governments are a busy place. I worked in government myself for 33 years. A million things going on, issues hitting the media, new issues, pro new problems coming up, everything going on at once. So governments are all about, politicians are all about setting priorities. Well, there's a main way that the government sets its priorities, and these are called mandate letters. And for I don't know how many years, when a premier is elected, or at major points of term, uh, the premier will issue mandate letter, a mandate letter to each minister. And in the mandate letter, the, minute, the premier says, here are your priorities. And what we started finding out in the, in the late 2000s and early 2010s from talking to people within the government was there were a number of places where the government had made election commitments to us on accessibility but did not direct the applicable minister to comply with that province promise in the mandate letter to that minister so we came to realize okay this is a problem so what are we going to do about it we tried a couple of things in 20, uh, in, in after we learned about this. We tried writing each minister to list the promises that minister, that the government made that relates to that minister and identifying why it's in their portfolio and asking them to act on it and let us know what their plans are and we'd be happy to work with you on it. And almost to a letter, what we got back is thank you very much for your views and we're doing a great job and nothing specific. Um, uh, in terms of a detailed response. So in the 2014 election, we approached all the parties and said, if you're elected, will you, among other things, make a, uh, give directions to your ministers to comply with your accessibility commitments and duties? And to our credit, remember, we're nonpartisan. We don't support any party, but I'm going to be mentioning the current premier uh, uh, as of the time I'm giving this lecture because that's what I got to do. Uh, Premier Wynne wrote us as part of her election commitments on May 14, 2014, and she promised that she would direct her ministers on their, on their election uh, or accessibility commitments. And also, before 2014, these mandate letters, we never got to see them. They weren't public. To its credit, the government decided in the fall of 2014, after it won the 2014 election, to, for the first time in Ontario, some other governments had done it before, now more are doing this now, to make their mandate letters public. Well, we, I read all those mandate letters, and guess what? Despite this promise, the majority of commitments on accessibility that the government and obligations they had made, undertaken, um, were not in those mandate letters. So, for example, the mandate letter to the minister responsible for enforcing the AODA did not say a word about enforcement of the AODA. Well, there's a message that it's not a priority. And we 
analyzed these. I, I released, we released an update that I wrote where I analyzed letter by letter. Here's what they promised. Here's what they asked, we asked them to do. Here's what's in the mandate letter. Here's what's missing. So it, this is not um, just surmise speculation or opinion. It's documented. And the government never fixed it. 2016, the premier issued another set of mandate letters, the same problem. And what we've seen, and, and this is where I believe Mayo Moran really had it right. What we'd seen is that uh, their government has certain priorities and we see them manifested. In the mandate letters that went out in 2016, it's clear that one of the priorities was climate change. And another priority was uh, improving the status of Aboriginal people. And of course, those are really important priorities and commendable that they're focusing on them. And if you read the 2016 mandate letters that the Premier of Ontario sent to each of her ministers, you will see that there are very detailed directions on each of those topics right across the board in almost every mandate letter, if not in every one. In contrast, the directions on disability left out again a majority of the commitments to us and the obligations to, regarding accessibility for us. And where there are commitments or directions, they are far less detailed than I, would, I, I saw in terms of the Aboriginal or uh, climate change uh, areas, just as two examples. So we know that that can work, and we know it hasn't worked for us. I think that that makes a difference. And when Mayo Moran says that we need a uh, greater leadership from the top, I think this is, is illustrative. Well, what was the government's answer uh, when the Mayo Moran report came out? Its first answer, the day it made it public, was not, we have a lot to improve. It was, we are global leaders on accessibility. We're not. Uh, I'm a proud Canadian and a proud Ontarian, but frankly, in terms of the developments I've seen, the, dis the difference between accessibility in uh, here for people with disabilities and somewhere like the United States, which uh, is way ahead of us. When I go to the States, I feel like I'm going through time travel forward into the future. Not that they're perfect and not that they don't, they've certainly got areas they need to improve, but they're way ahead of us. So let me go from this to sort of the bottom line and the, uh, and the, uh, the why to drill down into some more of the details. Um, let me first focus on the development of accessibility standards, because that's a centerpiece of this, uh, of this legislation. So how are we doing from 2014 to 2018 uh, in the area of developing accessibility standards? Uh, let's talk firstly about creating new ones because we didn't have enough uh, accessibility standards on the books or strengthening the existing ones. Well, I can tell you that of the detailed problems that we identified with the standards uh, that were on the books as of 2014, and the problems that Mayo Moran pointed out in her report delivered to the government late 2014, none of those problems have been fixed. So that's, a, that's a, a one starting point. Another way of looking at it is with all the accessibility standards that we now have on the books, even if every organization out there complied with each one of them to the letter, we would still not reach full accessibility by 2025. We would still not reach full accessibility ever. The government under the AODA is obliged to create all the accessibility standards needed to ensure we reach full accessibility by 2025. It has not fulfilled that duty. Um, well, if there aren't enough on the books, uh, what are they doing? Uh, to create new ones. Well, as far back as 2009, when the first five were, well, one had been enacted customer service, and the other four were still under construction, the government asked Charles Beer, what next standard should we make? So they were obviously turned their mind to it as far back as 2009. So did we. And starting around 2011 or so, and increased over time, we identified three more that we thought were the next round. Not the last round, but the next round. We proposed we needed one in the area of education, one in the area of healthcare, and one in the area of access to residential housing. 
We also repeatedly said we needed more action in the built environment. That what the government did in the building code and the public spaces standard were just woefully inadequate. And overarching all of this, we said that the overall approach the government's taken to creating accessibility has simply been to focus almost entirely on preventing new barriers, not on retrofitting and removing old ones. And you can't take an inaccessible society and make it fully accessible without addressing the existing barriers. You just can't do it. Uh, well, I will tell you that from 2014 to 2018, the government has not enacted a single new accessibility standard. The last time they enacted a new one was 2012. So really the past six years Pardon me. So if you, if you draw a comparison, the government was able to develop the entire AODA from October 20, um, 2003, when they got elected, till they introduced it for first reading in October 2004, and another six months till it was finally passed. So a year and a half from taking office to third reading on the bill, which is pretty good action quick decisions on what next first standards to make and within uh, after that decision within about five years maybe six they'd acted on uh, on all those areas maybe not as strongly as we like but they've acted in contrast they've slowed down to an almost a snail's pace it took them over four years to decide that we need a healthcare accessibility standard they finally announced that decision in February of 2015, over four years. And it took them another two years after that to take the first step towards developing it, and that's appointing a standards development committee just to start developing recommendations. Two years to set up a committee. It took them even longer to agree to do an education accessibility standard. The premier only agreed to that when grilled in question period in December of 2016 and we'd been advocating for this for years and even though she finally agreed commendably agreed uh, in December of 2016 as of the day I'm talking to you January uh, 25th 2018 over a year later they still haven't had the first meeting of the Standards Development Committees for developing recommendations in the Education Accessibility Center. Over a year there to just set up a committee. This is real lethargy in terms of, I mean, it's taking them longer to set up a committee than it took them to develop an accessibility bill and introduce it when they were just coming into power. Now, so, and in the third area where we've recommended action, which is residential housing, they've committed to nothing, they've undertaken to do nothing. Let me focus a little bit more closely in the areas of healthcare and education for a minute, just to give you a sense of what's going on. Um, I mean, it's gonna be months, if not years, before an access standard is made in those areas, given the rate at which they're going, uh, which concerns us because then organizations are going to have very little time to implement those standards and reach full accessibility by 2025. The, um, in the area of healthcare, the government, before it uh, went about even uh, appointing a committee, after it had agreed to do a, a, a healthcare accessibility standard, decided to conduct a pre consultation. They actually called it a pre consultation, asking uh, the disability community and others, what barriers in the healthcare system should uh, be addressed before they set up a committee to advise them on what healthcare barriers should be addressed. This is just creating bureaucratic duplication and waste. And when they set up, when they held that pre-consultation, they came in uh, with a uh, guide for the discussion of the pre-consultation, which suggested that they had actually decided to leave out most barriers in the healthcare system from the pre-consultation, therefore, in a sense, cutting them out before a standards development committee could even give advice on 
whether it, uh, uh, action is needed. For example, they propose to leave out the built environment in the healthcare system. Well, at the exact time that they said that, we had just made public that a brand new hospital in the core of Toronto, Women's College Hospital, had significant accessibility problems. Just built. Well, they backed down uh, fairly quickly on their attempt to say built environment uh, was going to be left out. But it was clear from the outset that they were trying to narrow the focus of it. And if you look at the mandate that the government has set for the, that committee, it's made it predominantly, if not exclusively, if it depends how you read it, but at least predominantly is to focus on barriers in the hospital sector. Now, barriers in the hospital sector are, of course, important. But if you think about where most people get most health care most of the time, it's not in hospitals. And to limit a health care accessibility standard to just hospitals is to basically say, well, we'll get to the rest later. But when's later going to be? 2025 is fast approaching. Similarly, in the area of education. In the area of education, last summer the government decided to launch a survey, uh, an online survey about barriers in the education system. And that can be helpful to get information together uh, to focus on, uh, uh, to, that could help a standards development committee. But that kind of survey should not have delayed getting a committee to roll up their appointed and getting to work. But more importantly, there are two problems with the survey. The first is, the way it was written, it left out many, if not most, of the barriers in the education system that students with disabilities face. We made all this public. And we urged people responding to add beyond the core focus of the survey, the wide range of barriers the government left out. And the second thing is the government was proposing to use the survey results to limit the scope of the Standards Development Committee. In other words, yet again, trying to pre-decide before a committee even gets to work what barriers it can advise on. The whole idea of a Standards Development Committee is for the committee to advise the government on what barriers need to be fixed, not the government to tell them, here's the only ones we want to hear about. Um, uh, but in any event, um, though, that's where we are in those two areas. And in the third major area, the built environment, we remain in a situation today where uh, the built environment, which is an important context for addressing accessibility, um, has largely been cut out of the AODA. When the legislation was being debated in 2004, 2005, if you read the debates in the, in the legislature, a lot of what the members of the legislature were talking about is the need to address the barriers in the built environment, including in old buildings. I think in no small part, the reason the province gave itself 20 years to reach full accessibility was because they recognized that the built environment was going to especially need more time. Well, since then, there is nothing about retrofitting any old barriers. And what's in place in the building code and public spaces standards, even if fully obeyed, still leads builders and architects to create new buildings with accessibility barriers. If you go to YouTube, search on the word Lepofsky, L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y, and Ryerson, and you will see a video that we released a few months ago of a new building right in the heart of downtown Toronto built with millions of public dollars, among others, at Ryerson University, the new student learning center, with significant accessibility problems. If you search on Lepofsky and Centennial College, you'll see a new building at Centennial College uh, that opened a year, uh, uh, that opened in, uh, I believe, in 2016. We released a video about that one. Similar pro uh, similarly, uh, a new building with accessibility problems. So we're not ensuring new buildings are accessible and we're not doing really anything about retrofitting old buildings, no matter how easy it is, no matter how cheap it is, no matter how productive it would be. And in this regard, we stand in marked contrast to some other jurisdictions. The US, the Americans with Disabilities Act, did require uh, building retrofits. 
and made a, made a real difference in the U.S. Not that it solved everything. Go to a country like Israel. They've passed uh, accessibility standards as well requiring some building accessibility retrofits. We can do it too. But we have it. And time is running out. Well, that's looking in the one part of the puzzle. Let me look at another part of the puzzle. And the other part of the puzzle is, uh, what about reviewing uh, the existing standards that we have? One of the th strengths in the AODA is it didn't just provide, you know, make a standard and then that's it. It requires the government to appoint a standards development committee uh, no more than five years after a standard is made to review it and determine if it needs to be uh, improved. It's a safeguard built in to help ensure that we uh, make new accessibility, uh, that, that the standards we make are really going to achieve the goal of full accessibility uh, by 2025. Um, well, how's that going? Well, the first accessibility stand, the, the short answer is so far, uh, not very well. The first accessibility standard that was ever enacted was the customer service accessibility standard made back in 2007. So it had to be reviewed starting in 20, uh, 2012. That review really got underway in uh, 2013 and uh, wrapped up um, a year or two later. How did it do? Well, it's a sad story. The, um, the, the problem, uh, the initial customer service standard was incredibly weak. It's only about eight pages long. Accessibility standards are supposed to detail the barriers you're supposed to remove, give specifics, tell you what you got to do by when. This standard largely doesn't even do that. Mostly it says create an accessibility policy, um, uh, train your staff on it, uh, and then uh, secure public feedback, or, or pardon me, provide an avenue for customers to give feedback on accessibility at your place or problems. Um, and those are helpful steps, but they're not details about how to remove specific and prevent specific barriers. There is some, but not much in there. Uh, and in 2012 and 2013, when this w went under review, uh, we presented, uh, in fact, the AODA Alliance and uh, ARCH presented a joint brief. The AODA Alliance presented some of its own uh, materials uh, to the Standards Development Committee. And later, after it reported out, we, uh, we presented a joint brief with ARCH uh, detailing concerns and recommendations. Um, the review took the weakest standard on the books and the result of it was not to strengthen it. A little tinkering, but in a couple of key ways, making it worse. And I will tell you that both the Standards Development Committee and the government, when it reviewed the report out from the Standards Development Committee, in effect disregarded everything we said. I don't expect to get everything, but was stunned to see that the, both the committee and then the public servants and the politicians literally rejected everything we had to say. For one thing, the result of the review was not to incorporate the kind of details it needed for organizations to know what exactly, what barriers to fix and how to fix them. But to make things easier for the government, and we actually, we and ARCH, uh, near the end of the process, presented to the government a joint brief of low cost, easy to implement changes. And even those were categorically rejected. In fact, the government wouldn't even agree, after Standards Development Committee to report out, government wouldn't even agree to call a meeting with us and some of the key obligated organizations, the restaurants and hotel associations, to see if we could work out some common ground. If we shook hands on a deal, maybe they could have made some changes, but they wouldn't even bring us together. What kind of things am I talking about? How about something as simple? I'm blind. Um, I go to the washroom, as do you. Wouldn't it be nice to know which washroom you're going into, whether it's the men's room or the women's room or a family washroom? Well, sighted people get a sign that tells them 
uh, which washroom it is, but most in most public buildings in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada, uh, there's no accessible signage. I go to the States, it's far more common to see a sign that has it in Kirby and Braille and, and so on. So we said, how about something as simple as, you know, a few bucks for a sign in your, if you provide public customer service to, on the washroom door. It's accessible. Well, that was too much. They wouldn't do that. But in a couple of important ways, believe it or not, the government not only didn't strengthen the weak standard, they actually made it worse. Um, and this, or, 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 or one way they made it worse, and in one way I shouldn't say they made it, they didn't make it worse, it was just they failed to fix it when they should. First, we pointed out that in the eight pages of the original 20, 2007 standard, there was a provision that we say is illegal, it shouldn't even be there. An accessibility standard can't create a barrier. They can remove barriers, they can't create a barrier. Well, the customer service standard does. It provides that somebody who operates, that a service providing organization can decide that a person with disabilities will only be admitted if they're accompanied by a support person. And they decide that's for the safe and health and safety of that individual or, uh, or others. And they can also charge an extra admission fee, if there is one, for the support person they're forcing the customer with disabilities to bring. Well, this is creating a barrier. We say it's completely illegal. We said it should have been removed when it was first enacted, and we urged the Standards Development Committee to recommend its removal. They didn't. They only recommended it be somewhat tightened. The government ignored our request that it be removed. I believe they may have slightly tightened it, but it's still there. And really, it's inexcusable to have an accessibility standard that says, you can create a barrier. You can say, you can't come in here unless we think you're a threat to the health safety of yourself or others, and you were going to charge you an extra admission fee for that second person. And uh, when I say we think, it isn't just that they have to have a subjective feeling. It's got to, it, it doesn't describe in those terms, but on the operational side, it, that's the way it's going to be carried out by those operating it, operating an organization. So um, that's leaving in place an illegal provision, and an, an effective review would have caught it and had it removed. But the other thing is the uh, in take in trying to re in reviewing this weak accessibility standard. The government actually made it weaker. And this is, let me tell you how. Under the standard, as I explained earlier, uh, organizations uh, that provide customer service to the public are required to have an accessibility store, uh, policy. The standard required any organization with 20 or more employees to have that policy in writing. And it's important that it be available on writing because you can have a policy and it's going to make a difference. People got to have to be able to see it, to read it. And if you're going to enforce the law, you need to require it to be in writing so the, uh, an inspector, investigator, whatever, can, can ask for it. And if it's produced, fine, you got a policy. If they don't produce one, it's because they don't have one. And the government decided to leave out organizations uh, in the private sector that had less than 20 employees because they didn't want to be burdensome on small business. Okay, I get that. I would have picked a lower number, but in 2007 they said 20 employees uh, 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 or more had to have it in writing. Well, in this 2014 review, 2013-2014 review, the government decided on the advice of a standards development committee to raise that employee number to 50. So now, organizations with 49 or less employees, yeah, they have to have an accessibility policy, but it doesn't have to be in writing. Well, what does that mean in practice? You're going to go enforce it. You show up and ask them to ask them where the policy is, and all they have to do is point to their head. Oh, it's in here. How do you train employees on a, a 49 employees on a policy that's not in writing? They require it to be trained, there to be training on it. How do you expect them to follow it if it's not in writing? 
how much of a burden is it to have it in writing if you've got 20 to 49 employees? This is a significant, this is thousands of organizations in the private sector who are effectively, for practical purposes, cut out of this requirement under the standard. And that's not only bad policy, but in the 2014 election, we asked the, the, uh, the parties to commit that they would not do anything to weaken any of the provisions or protections that we had secured in or under the AODA. And Premier Wynn wrote us May 14th, 2014, during the election, promising uh, making that pledge. Well, unfortunately, this change to the customer service standard not only hurts people with disabilities, uh, but it also uh, broke that promise. And the final problem with this, so all of that wasn't bad enough, but uh, the final problem with this uh, was that this, this in effect is a reward um, for law breaking. Because you see, we've got, as I told you earlier, um, a significant majority of private sector organizations with 20 or more employees had failed to violate, or probably failed to file um, their required accessibility self-reports. And that included, at the, those self-reports would ask them things like, do you have a policy on accessible customer service and so on. So what does the government do? They've got data showing substantial violations. So what they do, instead of providing the effective enforcement they promised, is to change the regulation to remove the requirement that the policy be in writing for uh, private sector organizations with 20 to 49 employees, therefore effectively rewarding them by making it in a, that, that requirement unenforceable. It just makes no sense as a matter of public policy. So that's one of the reviews that have been conducted. Um, a second review that is being conducted right now is by the, uh, a review of the transportation uh, provisions uh, that were enacted in 2011, provisions for accessible transportation. Now, there is a Transportation Standards Development Committee that's at work right now. Um, it has only put out its preliminary recommendations. The way the legislation works, a committee is formed, it does its work, comes up with ideas, and circulates draft recommendations for public input, and then goes back after it gets that input and decides what it's going to finally recommend. That committee has done nothing to solicit direct input from the public, as far as we can tell, before it formulated its preliminary or draft recommendations. It posted its draft, draft recommendations last spring for comment. Uh, we at Arch did a joint submission in the fall of, uh, in the summer of 2017, and in the fall of 2017, we actually appeared and presented for a half hour before that committee. Well, our analysis shows that the transportation standard itself um, is substantially lacking. It includes some helpful provisions, but obeying it does not ensure we, that we ever achieve fully accessible public transit or transportation services. The proposed changes that the Transportation Standards Development Committee has circulated as draft recommendations are, are at best extremely minor tinkering. They do not fix the standard. They do not significantly improve it. And in fact, this committee's proposal or draft recommendation said that their review is to see, uh, consider whether the standard is working as intended. And it looks like that language comes from the government itself, not from this committee. Well, that actually is the wrong test. They don't review it to see if it worked as intended. If it wasn't intended to achieve full accessibility and it's not achieving fully, full accessibility, it's working as intended. That is a totally inappropriate dilution, dilution of their purposes and their goal. Under the Act, the standard is supposed to ensure full accessibility by 2025, and the review after five years is to see if it's working to achieve the purposes of the Act. We pointed out in our brief that this standard doesn't come anywhere near ensuring full accessibility of public transit ever. So for example, there is nothing in the standard or in the, in the recommend, draft recommendations from the committee to address 
in, in terms of proposed amendments that would address the accessibility of transit stations and stops. And in the area of, uh, we've called for reforms to address, I mean, we're, right now as we speak, government is spending a lot of money building new uh, public transit and, and commuter lines and all that kind of stuff, but without standards to ensure their proper accessibility. That's just one example of the uh, many ways uh, that, they, uh, that they fall flat. There is nothing in the standard to effectively ensure that new fair paying technology, like the Presto kiosks, are accessible. When Presto came out with its initial kiosks in the, uh, uh, or it's around 2010, we were in the front of the line pointing out real accessibility problems with them. Now, the AODA regs that were regulations that were passed in 2011 just said that they had to include accessibility features. Well, that could mean one sticker in Braille and there's an accessibility feature. It didn't require that they ensure that they are actually accessible. And Presto, using public money, it was a government project, led to a bunch of inaccessible machines being deployed. Now, now they're deploying new ones, um, which have more features, uh, but still, there are no standards in there to ensure that this is all uh, done properly. So now, what, what will the Transportation Standards Development Committee ultimately recommend? We're, we have to await that. We've presented, we presented a brief that I believe was in excess of 100 pages, did an oral presentation, left about 10 minutes for questions, and did not get a single question, not a single question from the committee. So um, we have no idea uh, what, if anything, they, they think about it uh, as a committee. So let me turn just for a couple of minutes to talk about the process for developing accessibility standards because as we look at what's been achieved, we should look at how they're doing it. Um, and I know it might sound a little dry talking about standards development process. Uh, people care about the outcome, but there are, um, it, it's worth a focus. So uh, here's, uh, here's the deal. Back in 2010, the government was told that this process needs to be reformed. They're told that it's just, you know, they, 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 they took a decent crack at doing it, but, um, you know, you learn while you're doing, and that's understandable. This is all a new uh, venture. Uh, but the, uh, the government was told by the Charles Beer Independent Review, the first one, um, that, the, uh, that the process for developing accessibility standards should be put under one roof, not a bunch of disparate committees, and it should be arm's length from government. The U.S., they use a different process. They have a, a thing called the Access Board. It's got a longer name. They're uh, funded by government, but they're, uh, they're quite independent. They make recommendations. And then, of course, the recommendations have to go to government for approval. Uh, we thought that was a good idea, too, um, rather than having it administered and buried within the public service. Well, the government came up with a, uh, a compromise solution after the Beer Report which was to have all the standards development work done under a committee that's created at the AODA called the Accessibility Standards Advisory Council. It's one of these government advisory councils. There's a million of them advising government on the status of women and the status of various other groups. So there's this committee too. They said, why don't we have them do it? And we initially thought that was a good idea because it didn't require any amendments to the legislation. We didn't want the legislation amended. It turned out to be a complete flop. And I mean a complete flop. That's the committee, that council, is the council that did the customer service review. And they didn't listen to a word we said. And they end up encouraging the government to break its own promise, not to weaken its own uh, uh, regulations. And the government acted on that, saying, well, we were advised by our committee. We find that governments tend to act more readily on advice from accessibility advisory bodies if it's recommendations to repeal or cut back on things. Less aggressively, uh, substantially less, when they're urged to do more on accessibility. Um, so that didn't work. Um, now they're just appointing individual ad hoc committees and we're, we're not complaining because we think that's better than all going to one council uh, where you could end up having screw up. They tried it, didn't work. But I think, and this is what we're recommending to the federal government for the national accessibility law that they're gonna introduce this spring. I think the core message is 
the accessibility, development of recommendations for accessibility standards should be taken right out of government. It should be with an independent body. We shouldn't have to spend five years or four years or whatever number of years to get a government to agree that a third of a million students with disabilities face too many barriers. It's worth looking at developing a standard or patients with disabilities face too many barriers in our healthcare system. Uh, it just shouldn't take that long. Uh, we need to de take that out of politics. The other thing about the standards development process that we've uh, learned is that it needs to be more open. Now the AODA itself provides for detailed openness provisions. And I was involved in negotiating these when I led the campaign uh, for this legislation for our predecessor, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee. If you look at the AODA, sections eight and nine, it requires that Standards Development Committee keep minutes of their meetings and make them public. It requires that all of their recommendations are public. It requires that their mandate is public. It requires that their progress reports to the ministers are public. Given that, um, it's troubling that when I appeared before with, with ARCH, Disability Law Center, before the Transportation Standards Development Committee, first thing out of the mouth of the chair, I mean, a chairperson of that committee, excuse me, was, these meetings are confidential. They said, no, they're not. And I told them I, uh, that they're not, and that if, when we give the government input like this on what we're recommending, we're not committing, that we won't tell anyone what we, what we told you. In this case, the uh, Standards Development Committee. The whole idea of openness is that they are accountable. But there's another problem, and that is, the whole idea of people on these committees is not that they're just one-off individuals that are just giving their own personal opinions. They want them to be able to access their network, whether it's somebody from a disability organization or from a, uh, a network of colleges or universities or hospitals or whatever. They've got to be able to reach out to their sector and find out, here's what we're discussing, what do you think? And the problem is that having uh, expecting confidentiality like the chair of the Transportation Standards Development Committee uh, said to me in the case of that meeting, uh, impedes their ability to do that. Well, it's supposed to be an open process. It needs to be a more open process. Um, I know that whether it's politicians or public servants, and it's not distinctive by any particular political party, sometimes want to control these things and uh, have a handle on what gets out, but th that, that's just not acceptable. And that is, I think, undermining the effectiveness of the process. There are several other standards now being reviewed. The Employment standards uh, Standard is being reviewed by uh, uh, Standards Development Committee. The Information Communication Standard is being reviewed, and later this year, there will, a committee is supposed to be appointed to review the public spaces requirements regarding uh, parts of the built environment. However, we don't know anything of what they're doing other than if you read their minutes. Because as far as I know, none of them have reached out uh, to, um, to uh, us or to the broader community to get any input. They haven't, they're waiting, I gather, or they may be waiting until they first circulate their preliminary or draft recommendations. But it makes a whole lot more sense to get input before you make those recommendations so that after you write your draft recommendations, any input is just going to be um, refined um, focus rather than uh, broadly pointing out that there are entire areas they, they left out. Um, that all needs to change uh, or else we're not going to be effectively served. Now, let me now turn to the area. So that's developing accessibility standards. And I've talked about it for a long time because it's really an important part of this act. Where we end up with, as I said, is we do not, we have some standards on the books. They are helpful to a point but they do not cover um, uh, the, uh, a substantial number of the barriers in the sectors they regulate, and they do not cover all the bar uh, sectors that need to be regulated. Um, and the, uh, so let me now turn to the uh, issue of enforcement, because standards are great, but <laughs> to the extent they're obeyed. And when the government was, this current government was in opposition in the 90s, um, and the uh, Mike Harris Conservative government was in power. They had promised the Disabilities Act, but it said it will not have enforcement. It will be a voluntary law. And the uh, Liberal Party went in opposition, and the do Democrats that uh, when they were in opposition un unanimously uh, um, decried this by saying a law that has not got effective enforcement is not going to be effective. And in fact, uh, the day the AODA passed, there was a con news conference at Queen's Park um, I appeared at it for, I was invited to speak there for 
Uh, from a disability perspective, there's a business representative for the Retail Council of Canada, and there was the minister who brought in the legislation, Dr. Marie Boutriani, no longer in politics, and herself a psychologist. And we all united to in, endorse the legislation, and she spoke at that news conference saying that, look, we've learned from other areas that if you want a law obeyed, there's got to be, you know, effective enforcement. Well, the government promised effective enforcement. Um, how are we doing? Well, I've already told you that as of the fall of 2013, things were not going well. That there was, uh, that we had revealed that there was not effective enforcement going on at all. Pardon me. And we'd had to resort to a freedom of information uh, application to get that information. Well, at that time, in the fall of 2013, the minister then responsible, uh, who was uh, 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 Dr. Eric Hoskins, said, we've got to do better and we're going to crack down and we're going to launch it, uh, we're going to target some organizations and so on. And they got to work on doing that. And what they found, pardon me, for the couple of thousand organizations they decided to actually reach out and do some enforcement with, is they found they were getting them to bring themselves into compliance. Hardly surprising. It shows it can work. But along comes Mayo Moran in the fall of 2014, who says, uh, echoing our concerns, that enforcement needs to be more rigorous. That report is released to the public on February 13th, 2015. Why is that date important? Because six days later, on February 19th, the new minister responsible for the act, a gentleman named Brad Duguid, writes my coalition letter saying, in effect, We'd written saying, what are you doing about enforcement? And his answer, if you look at his numbers, was they're cutting enforcement by over a third. They were cutting by over a third the number of organizations they were going to audit in 2015. So they get an independent review saying you got to do more and their solution is do a third less. Well, the media slammed them. We took this public, editorials, so on. Um, and uh, when June, June rolled around of that year, June 2015, and that was an important point in time because that was the 10 year anniversary of the AODA. 10 years since it was passed, 10 years left to reach full accessibility. And at that point, the government um, um, decided to hold a big celebration and release a new action plan to implement the, uh, the Mayo Moran report and, and so on. Uh, and uh, they announced a crackdown on June 3rd, 2015. They announced, they got headline news. They're going to crack down on AODA violators. They're going to, starting in 2016, they're going to start increasing the number of organizations they audit with a goal of going up to 4,000, which would be double the 2,000 cap that they had reached the year before the Brad Duguid 30% or more cutback. Well, I filed a Freedom of Information request the next day, June 4th to ask for that plan. You're announcing a new plan? We want to see it. We asked for some other information too. That led to a substantial freedom of information battle, not just over that, but over the full range of information I was seeking, which led me to have to appeal to the Information Privacy Commissioner, which has only yielded the doc some of the documents we sought a few months ago. They did give us some of the stuff we wanted right uh, within a few months, but they wanted to charge us 4,200 bucks for the rest of it told them we have no money, they can waive the fee under the legislation if it's a financial hardship. It's a financial hardship, we argue, if you're an unfunded coalition that has no money. We had to take that to the Information Privacy Commission. We won part, but not all of our appeal, got the information. So far, we're still digging, but so far that headline-grabbing leak to the Toronto Star of a brand new, spanking new crackdown on AODA violators uh, we're still having trouble finding it. We're still looking as of the day I'm um, telling you this, but so far uh, one would think normally when you have a new a policy or uh, strategy like that and it's important enough to, on a major event, to uh, feed it to the media, there's usually quite a paper trail. Uh, we're still looking. The, uh, but so on enforcement, uh, yes, there is some stuff going on. There is some enforcement going on, but over the years, uh, since uh, we raised, these, since the legislation became enforceable, what we know is this. Number one, as of any data we've gotten, the most recent being, I believe, last summer, um, for a period before that, 
there is still substantial, over a majority of private sector organizations with at least 20 employees are still in violation of the legislation in some way. We also know, and that's known to the government, we also know that the uh, number of actual audits is a tiny, tiny fraction of the government. We've urged the government to diversify the number of people who can do this work because they, as of last summer, the number of people appointed to be inspectors or directors under the act with direct enforcement powers was a grand total of five for all of Ontario. Now, they can still delegate some of their authority to others, but five for the whole province of Ontario. A few months ago, I spoke to the uh, Disability Rights Commission uh, for the government of Israel, much smaller country, much fewer people, much less territory to go around, and a few other uh, political, military, and other issues on their plate, and they have more than double the inspectors we have for the province of Ontario. But not only that, what we've learned, what we did to, to we've recommended the government for years is to improve the uh, presence, the enforcement presence of the AODA. Why don't they deputize inspectors under some other legislation at the Ministry of Transportation or Labor or somewhere else? Well, after years of proposing it, we understand they did a pilot project, but they have not released to us the results. That was, that, that's, uh, so we don't know where that's at right now um, or what next will be coming, if anything, with that. What we've also learned about enforcement is that in no small part, in significant part, possibly the majority of enforcement efforts is not involved, does not involve actually going to the premises of any organization and actually inspecting it and seeing how accessible it is. But rather, it's an audit of the paper trail. So if an obligated organization, I've been told this by an obligated organization, they ask us to send us the documents, here's our policy, here's our documents on what training we've done, and as long as our, and whatever other documents, are, here's our plan, whatever, as long as we got the paper trail, they say we're fine. Or if the paper trail is inadequate, they say improve the paper trail. Doesn't matter if they're actually doing anything under it, as long as there's a, a drawer that's got the paper in it, or a computer that's got the file on it, to the extent all you do is a paper audit, that's, in our view, substantially uh, inadequate. So, and, and what I think is, uh, lies at the core of this problem um, is that um, and not all laws that are, enforced, that are enforceable are subject to such poor enforcement. But I think one of the core problems here is that the, that the um, uh, enforcement, like the standards development process, is buried within the government itself. And it's subject to political direction or bureaucratic stultification. It also involves the government enforcing against itself. The largest respondent or obligated organization in Ontario is going to be the government of Ontario. And needless to say, that's kind of a difficult position uh, to be in. So we have recommended for years uh, that the enforcement process, like the standards development recommendation process, be taken out of government and be operated at arm's length from the government. We're recommending the same to the federal government for development of its accessibility legislation. So as of the, to summarize, as of the time I'm speaking to you, Ontario, in terms of the commitment for effective enforcement, is not uh, doing an effective job. Right now, um, just to put a, a closing point on this before I move to uh, a couple of other uh, closing areas, uh, the, if you one of the things one of the when you have so limited a staff allocation to this, one of the ways that you could really make progress on enforcement is by rely, crowdsourcing it, by relying on individuals to report there's a problem, and if they report there's a problem. You don't have to act on every single report, but at least do what you can to either uh, uh, to act on the more serious ones and, and so on. Well, to that end, we pressed the government for years to create a toll-free hotline that people could call to report AODA violations as part of the enforcement process. Uh, and if you go to our website, aodaalliance.org, um, and you search on toll-free hotline or just toll-free number, you're going to see that we took it took forever to get them to, uh, it took an extraordinary amount of time to get them to establish it and finally announce it. 
They committed to publicize it, but we've seen no real publicity of it. And when people call it, they get, uh, uh, we've gotten feedback as recently as just the past couple of weeks that they can be told, sorry, we'll, we'll take down this information, but the Accessibility Directorate uh, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, just aggregates the data uh, for its own use. If you want to, you know, and they uh, suggest you should go to a, the Human Rights Tribunal if you've got a problem. Well, the whole idea underlying the AODA um, is that people shouldn't have to do that. We wanted standards that were effectively uh, designed and effectively enforced so people wouldn't have to fight these barriers one at a time through individual human rights co uh, complaints. That's the whole purpose of this legislation. So enforcement right now, uh, the opportunity to crowdsource and, and rely on this is just not being done uh, effectively in Ontario at all. And the result of this is I believe that the word's out, that you don't really have to worry about it. When there were only two monetary penalties imposed in all of 2015 and 2016 combined, it tells you exactly how much people feel they gotta worry about for enforcement. I spoke at an international conference on disability and technology uh, a couple years ago, and I remember talking to a, um, some folks down there, even in the States, the word is out, that the enforcement up here is is not what it should be. Well then, what about the other levers of power that are available to the government? The government has other levers of power where it, that it can leverage to achieve accessibility. Let me just quickly go through how we're doing on, on, on those. Um, for one thing, there's a question of government leadership. How well is it doing on this? We were very excited in 2013 when Premier Wynn, in her very first throne speech, um, had the accessibility portfolio move from the Community and Social Services Ministry uh, to the um, Ministry of Economic Development uh, and later called Economic Development and Employment. It's changed its name several times. And why would we care? Is it just shuffling the bureaucratic deck? No, we, we wanted to get out of a, a venue where it was seen as a social assistance strategy and we wanted accessibility built into Ontario's economic development strategy. Government had kept saying it's good for business to do accessibility, let's make it part of their policy. Well, we, uh, we the new minister who got that portfolio, Eric Hoskins, in the summer of 20, or the spring of 2013 said he's, gonna, he's directing his ministry to incorporate accessibility in their various programs. We've not been able to find any indication that that ever happened, that it actually materialized or ever made a difference. And if anything, what it turned out to is that the move to that ministry was counterproductive, that that ministry actually that's where we got cuts to the customer service standard. That's where it took place. And so we were, uh, Charles Beer recommended that we needed a standalone minister um, eight years ago, 2016, the premier decided to do that and appointed a new, our first ever minister of accessibility. Um, the problem is that six months, and we congratulated that, the problem is that six months later the minister of accessibility also became the Minister of Government Services. So she's now the lead minister to enforce the AODA and the lead organization, the biggest organization she's got to enforce against is the Ontario Public Service. She's now also the minister responsible for the operations of the Ontario Public Service. Just tells you all the more so why uh, you need this enforcement stuff to be independent of government. So that's the first lever of power uh, is effective leadership within the government and we've had this uh, problem. And by, by the way, that merger is not the responsibility of that minister. She gets assigned what she's assigned. Um, but that's, uh, we haven't seen um, the transition uh, to a new minister uh, who's no longer a standalone minister. She's got other responsibilities. When she got the first portfolio, when she got the accessibility portfolio in 2016, she also had women's uh, issues, which is an important issue. Absolutely. But it's a, uh, once they had a government services, it became, um, we believe it, it was a real step backwards. Um, another lever of power the government has is government money. Attaching accessibility strings to government money, whether it's uh, buying things, procurement of goods and services, or funding capital infrastructure, or business development grants, or research grants, uh, any of those kinds of uh, expenditures, uh, if effectively tagged with accessibility requirements, could make a huge difference and not really cost the government much at all. They give out the same amount of money, they're just attaching more strings. Well, the AODA 
uh, standards have some weak language on uh, require uh, uh, in uh, on some of this, um, but it isn't really making a huge difference. I haven't seen any concerted government strategy telling the private sector, "You want our money? You got to play by the accessibility rules, and we're going to actually expect more of you." Moreover, uh, examples of the Ryerson Student Learning Center or Centennial College Culinary Arts Center, government uh, of public buildings with uh, uh, our illustrations uh, that this is not really, turn, uh, that the idea of leveraging government money is not uh, working effectively, is not being deployed effectively. Um, to make it work, you need government standards, setting rules, what, what restraints are, are to be attached. You need effective auditing and monitoring to make sure uh, that it actually materializes. Lots of people across government spend lots of money and just telling them just, it's some regulation or some broad statement, oh, by the way, please uh, uh, take into account accessibility, uh, isn't enough. Um, another lever of government power is reviewing its own legislation. Government has lots of statutes, lots of regulations. If they authorize or require accessibility barriers or don't require removal of them, we're going to have more problems. 2007, we asked the party leaders in the election, will you promise uh, to, remove, to undertake a complete review of all laws for accessibility barriers? All the leaders agreed, including the liberals. And uh, now here we sit 11 years later. Of the 750 statutes, statutes in Ontario, they've only reviewed about 50 or 55 of them. And they only completed that review about two years ago. And they only made tinkering amendments, just tinkering amendments that left out many of the significant barriers in the very bills they were amending. And there is no detailed timelines been announced for reviewing the other 700 statutes and all the regulations. Um, there's no reason this has to take this long. Uh, elections. Municipal and provincial elections are under provincial jurisdiction. We had amendments on accessibility to both the municipal and provincial legislation uh, to address barriers facing voters with disabilities back around 2010. These amendments, 2010, 2011, these amendments were way weaker than we need um, and they've turned out not to achieve accessibility for voters with disabilities. Um, we've urged telephone and internet voting as an option. It's available in I think upwards of 40 municipalities in Ontario as of a couple of years ago. Perfectly available, but it, at the provincial level, we don't have it. And we don't have it because Elections Ontario has refused to even test it, even though they've been given a statutory mandate to do so. They have an unreviewable, arbitrary discretion to not even try. Um, so among those levers, those are among the uh, levers of power that the uh, government has. Uh, the, the last one that I want to refer to uh, is the um, uh, R2. One is the Ontario Public Service itself. The government said that they want the Ontario government to lead by example on accessibility. In fact, I think they're leading from behind. They're leading by the wrong example. We demonstrated this in our brief to the, uh, uh, to the Mayo Moran Independent Review in June of 2014. Mayo Moran agreed that they needed to do reforms. We've seen nothing in the way of reforms there. Government is a big organization. They're, they're good at cranking out policies that are in a binder somewhere, but not in actually making them work as a reality. We've proposed a couple of fairly straightforward measures. We said they should have a chief accessibility officer. They don't. We've proposed, they had a assistant deputy minister responsible for accessibility. Charles Beer called the position vital. Their solution when the individual in that position uh, moved on to another job was to make it go from full-time to part-time. And it remained that way ever since, even despite a 2011 election promise from the Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty, to have a full-time person in that position. So uh, we've proposed that there are accessibility lead persons, they're called accessibility leads, in each ministry, but they're buried way down in the bureaucracy. We've urged that they should be uh, reporting to a deputy minister. They should be way up at the top. Not a big deal, it's the same person, just move them up. Haven't done that. We've only been urging that for, I think, four or five years. 
maybe just three, but way too long. Finally, in terms of the levers of power, the government has proposed back in 2013 that employment for people with disabilities was to be a new priority, including in the private sector. And the idea was to come up with an employment strategy beyond what you do in accessibility regulations under the legislation. That was really commendable. It took the government a full year after making that announcement to do anything. And the anything it did was to appoint a part-time advisory committee from the business community to give it recommendations. That committee was appointed in the, the winter of 2014. Its recommendations, I think, were finally, they rendered an interim report about a year later, more or less, a final report that really just was a fine-tuning of its interim report, largely, and it took the government till June of 2017 to announce any strategy. And its announcement was, had a couple of good ingredients, but was pretty weak. And among other things, it said it was going to appoint another advisory committee of people from the business community. So it's, it's really slow action. Now, I'm not saying none of this helps. And I'm not saying there's bad intention underlying all of it, but if it's a priority in the February of 2013, it required more action than these kind of steps that were announced four years later. So, what do we do about it? First, we should, let me conclude by focusing on what, what needs to be done, just for a couple of minutes. We're really at a pivotal point. We're at a pivotal point in time now because of two things. I'm speaking at the end of January uh, 2018, the government is required within the next 19 days, if not sooner, to appoint the next independent review. This independent review is going to be able to take the province's temperature again. It is going to be absolutely critical for that independent review to give the government a strong message. Charles Beer tried to say it politely. Mayo Moran tried to say it politely, but more firmly. The next independent review can't pull its punches. I'm not saying anybody pulled their punches, but I'm saying they need to really make the message come loud and clear that we need uh, dramatic change, uh, substantial improvement in the way this legislation is implemented. Uh, as well, June of this year is uh, a provincial election. Uh, our coalition is totally nonpartisan. We never endorse a party or oppose a party or support a candidate or oppose a candidate. What we do is run a nonpartisan campaign where we ask the parties to each make election commitments. We'll be doing that again here. And interestingly, this is going to coincide with the, more, uh, the next independent review. So as we're recommending reforms to the review, we're also going to be trying to get political leadership, uh, whichever be the party uh, that wins, to have made commitments on this. And then we'll be urging people with disabilities to, to raise these issues in the campaign, whoever they vote for. We never give anybody any suggestion of who they vote for. We want to be able to work with anyone uh, who gets elected. But in doing this, we are going to want to focus on the areas I've talked to you about. Showing new leadership at the top, the kind that both Charles Beer and Mayo Moran said uh, was needed, but which unfortunately hasn't happened. Getting commitments that are made to us turned into mandate letters that lead to actual action. Uh, we are going to want to see um, uh, um, the government take on the task now of uh, committing itself to making all the standards, accessibility standards it needs to, to ensure that we get to full accessibility by 2025, less than seven years from now. We want to see the standards development process and the enforcement process taken, uh, I think we're going to want to uh, see them taken out of government and put it in an arm's length position from the government. Government will ultimately decide what standards to enact, but we're developing recommendations. This has got to be taken right out of government because of the, 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 the problems that we've documented. We want to see the government, uh, whoever's in charge, really putting its hand on every lever of power it can to effectively uh, throttle us forward towards accessibility. Doing it in a clever way, not in a uh, uh, cost-burdensome way, uh, doing it in an effective way. But overarching all of this, what we really need is a plan. Governments are not big into doing multi-year plans, or if they do, it's like two, three years. Like, let's just see if we can make progress for two, three years. Politicians tend not to think about what's going to go on in seven years. They're just trying to get through the day, the week, the month, the election, the whatever, the crisis or whatever that they're facing. And I understand that. It's human nature. It's understandable. But what we need now is a plan from here to 2025, and we don't have one. 
Back in June of 2015, the then minister responsible for Brad Duguid announced a plan that they called the road to 2025. But within a day, talking to the media, he, I think, accurately conceded that it wasn't really a 10-year plan, it was more like a 12-month plan. Well, those 12 months were up by 2016 in the middle. It's now the start of 2018. We need a plan uh, that, takes into, that identifies everything that needs to be done and maps out the, road, uh, the path. The next government that's elected in Ontario, whoever they are, is going to be at the point which will, for the most part, decide whether we are going to be make or not make the 2025 uh, destination. Because the next government's going to be in power from June of 2018, if it's a majority government, till 2022. And if we keep progressing at the slow pace we're going now, a new government elected in June of 2022 is not going to be able to make all the standards needed in 20, June, <laughs> right then and there and then ensure that everybody can comply with them so that uh, two and a half years later, or whatever it is, uh, we, we're at full accessibility. So the next term of office is pivotal. Moreover, the next independent review is pivotal because if it starts in February of this year, reports in the next year, that means the next independent review won't be taking place till 2023 or 2024. Uh, maybe late 2022. So by the time the next independent review is taking place, um, it in turn will not be able to make recommendations uh, that will uh, uh, get us back on track if we're not then on track and on schedule. It'll have to make recommendations of what our next fallback position is. And I, for one, the coalition for which I speak, is certainly not prepared to concede that 2025 uh, is a destination that we, we're going to give up on or, or can't reach. So let me conclude by saying this. There are no losers when it comes to achieving accessibility. Achieving accessibility helps everyone. It helps everyone who has a disability now. It helps everybody else who will get one later. It helps every organization, every business that wants more customers and a broader pool of employees. It helps the public service better serve the public. It helps school boards do a better job of educating kids. Uh, in colleges and universities, uh, the same. On the other hand, failing to do an effective job of implementing the AODA hurts all of those folks. It obviously hurts people with disabilities who continue to be denied accessibility and access to the full opportunities that our province provides. As well, it hurts businesses because they get narrower access to labor, uh, uh, access to a smaller labor supply. They don't get the benefit of all the employees with disabilities from whom they could benefit. They don't get access to all the customers with disabilities from whom they could uh, make more money. And similarly, the public service does not benefit by in it not being able to effectively serve the minority of people with disabilities who is ultimately the minority of everyone. That's, that's the situation now, but our population is aging. So every year that goes by, a greater proportion of our population is older. With age comes disabilities. So if this is a problem now, it's just going to continue to become a bigger problem uh, over time. I know we can get there. I'm sorry that we haven't gotten as far as uh, I'd like, uh, that we expected and hoped and were, were, were promised. But I am ultimately an optimist, and I believe we can get there by taking the kind of reforms that we proposed and will be proposing over the next months. Thanks very much, and I, I welcome a chance to take your questions.